We continue our look at the F8 pilot paper by turning to question one. So we're going to have a look at question one now. Usually the hardest question in the entire examination and this is no exception. In fact, it's an absolute devil of a question. The question's called Westra. The question's called Westra. In my BPP kit, it's on uh, question 50, but uh, you might be sourcing the question from elsewhere. It's called Westra, and it's from the pilot paper. And um, that's a nightmare, absolute nightmare. Just take a look at the requirements. It says, A, list the substantive audit procedures you would perform to confirm the assertions of completeness, occurrence, and cutoff for the financial state for purchases. For purchases in the financial statements of Westra, for each procedure, explain the purpose of that procedure. It is difficult to imagine a more difficult question. Um, this, of course, is a pilot paper and no one did it live. But had it been a live examination, you would be mad to do this first. I mean, you'd be absolutely insane. Let's just have a look at how difficult this is. First of all, it is substantive procedures. It's always difficult inventing substantive procedures off the top of your head. But let's have a look at what we're doing substantive procedures for. We're doing substantive procedures for purchases. And if you know anything about auditing, you'll know that purchases appears on the income statement. And normally on the income statement, we do control testing on the income statement. We do our substantive procedures on the balance sheet. That's the usual way to do audit. Substantive procedures on the balance sheet and control tests on the income statement. We're on the income statement doing substantive procedures. How hard is that? And it's not just purchases that we are auditing. It's very specifically completeness, occurrence and cutoff of purchases. Ah, it's, it's rock hard. And one would be insane to do it first, so I'm not going to. I'll do it last. Part B. List the order procedures you would perform uh, on trade payables, balance. For each procedure, explain the purpose of that procedure, which is it's pretty standard, to be honest with you. Part B is fine, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, first of all, trade payables, of course, is the trade creditors appearing on the, uh, the balance sheet, on the statements of financial position. The normal process for auditing the statement of financial position is to do substantive procedures. This is substantive procedures. It says, sorry, it says list the audit procedures. So the audit procedures you would do on payables, on the payables balance, to substantiate the balance would be substantive procedures. So this is just normal substantive procedures that you would normally do on your payables. And you only have to come up with four because you have to explain the purpose of each procedure. So it's going to be a tabular answer. Well, I'm, I mean, I'm not saying it's dead easy or anything like that, but it's, it's certainly a lot easier than part A. So we'll start with part B, I suggest. And then C, describe the control procedures that should be in place over the standing data on the trade payables master file in Westra's computer system. I mean, if you can translate the question, if you can translate the requirement... Well, it's not too bad, but, I mean, how about that for technical language? How about that for jargon? Standing data. There's two forms of data, basically, that work. Uh, I mean, this is an oversimplification, and it isn't necessarily true on your particular system that you have at work. However, nevertheless, there's, when we're talking about normal IT systems, there's two different levels of data, what they call standing data and transactional data. So, for example, on what are we talking about here? We're talking about payables. So the transactional data will be the purchases that we make and the payments that we make to the, the payables. The credit notes that we receive, the damaged goods that we identify, these things are called transactional balances. These things are called transactional data, and they make the balance go up and down. So the transactional balances, the transactional data is kept separate from what's called the standing data. Now, the standing data is the, you know, the name of the contact, the telephone number, the address, uh, the bank account details. All of these things are constant, and they stand still. 
and therefore they're called standing data. And you need controls over them for the fairly obvious reason that you don't want the um, trade payables clerk putting himself on the standing data and then starting to pay himself. That's what you don't want, right? That would be a fraud. You don't want someone getting into the standing data, creating themselves as an authorised supplier and then supplying nothing but paying themselves money from the company bank account. So you need controls over the standing data. And we've just got to suggest what they are. I think once you've translated Part C, the requirement for Part C, it's not too bad. And then D, discuss the extent to which computer-assisted audit techniques might be used in your audit of purchases and payables at uh, Westra and Co. Basically, it's asking you how much do you want to use your computer to audit their computer. In audit, there's always at least one computer. That's the client's computer. However, the, the normal way of auditing the client's computer is just to, you know, have a go at it yourself. Just use the screen, use the keyboard, you know, get the data, print things off, walk about, be a human. So you'd have a human auditing the uh, client's computer, and that's normal audit procedures. However, it is possible to bring along your own laptop. You can bring along your own laptop and with a USB cable you can plug it in and you can suck data and systems out of the client's um, computer and you can use your computer to audit their computer. What is it called when you use your computer to audit their computer? It's called computer-assisted audit techniques. And the question is, do you want to use CATS? And the answer is usually no, you don't. Just check this out. If a system is completely rubbish, this is maybe a bit advanced and beyond what you really need for D, but I think it might help you. If the system is completely rubbish, then you won't even able, be able to do uh, human-based control tests. So if the system's okay, you can do control testing. For the system to be good enough for you to do computer-assisted audit techniques, the system needs to be absolutely brilliant and largely computer-based. So what type of business is good enough for you to use CATS? Well, it's the big supermarkets, the big banks, etc., etc., etc. It's big businesses with high transactional volume and fantastically tight computer systems. If their system is super tight, then you'll be able to do your control testing by using your computer on their computer. So there's basically three levels of systems. There's rubbish, where you have to do substantive testing. There's good, where you can do control testing. And then there's brilliant, where you can do control testing using your own computer to audit their computer. So the question is, really, is their system brilliant? And usually in these questions, the answer is no. It's okay, but it's not brilliant, and therefore cats would not be appropriate. And then look at the size of that scenario. It's jimongous. And you've got, what is it, 30 marks? 30 marks gives you 54 minutes in order to do this. It's, it's horrendous. So don't think that you can fully understand the scenario in those 54 minutes. I mean, it would take you 54 hours to fully understand this scenario in the question Westra. So just zip through the scenario, get a feel for the scenario, but make sure you definitely do understand the requirements. That's the key, the requirements. I've mentioned this many times. The key is the requirements. You understand those, you'll pass. If you understand the requirements and the scenario perfectly, you'll get the prize. But clearly, the, the first aim is to pass. Therefore, make sure you're crystal clear on the requirements, get a general feel for the scenario, and then go for it. So here's the scenario. So Westra assembles mobile uh, telephones in a large factory. Each telephone contains 100 different parts, with each part being obtained from one of 50 authorised suppliers. So in other words, they're telling you it's a big company, and they're also telling you it's in... It's a factory, it's an assembly business. 
Like many companies, Western's accounting systems are partly manual and partly computerized. In overview, the systems include uh, one, design soft software, whatever that means. Uh, two, computerized database of suppliers, which is a bespoke system written in-house at Westra. Um, a bespoke system is like a bespoke suit. What that means is you went to the tailor and the tailor tailored the suit to fit your shoulders exactly, okay? So a bespoke system has been written by a consultant specifically for us. And when it comes to Part D, that's a big problem because as auditors, when we go to Westra, what we want to do is we want to go... You remember um, computer-assisted audit techniques is bringing our computer with our computer programs and using our computer programs and computer data to test theirs. What we want to do is we want to bring over our standardized CATs. We want to bring our standardized CATs from the other clients where we've used standardized CATs. So, for example, uh, we want to bring our CATs that we used at Marks and Spencers, um, at Sainsbury's, at... Um, uh, at Microsoft, at Ford Motor Vehicles. What we want to do is we want to, is we want to bring our standardized, standard programs for testing standardized programs across from other clients. We don't want to be writing our own software specifically for this. <laughs> so it's a problem. It's good that they have a computerized database, but it's a problem that it's bespoke. So, because what we'd have to do to do cats is we'd have to write a specific load of cats for this particular client, which is just just a non-starter. What you want to be able to do is you want to use the same cats from client to client to client, which is fantastic, of course, when they use Sage. When they use Sage, you just bring your cats from the last client and you use it in the next client. Great, if they use Sage from client to client. Three, a manual system for recording goods inwards and transferring information to the accounts department. So they've got a manual system, which is, again, bad news for Part D. Um, a computerised payables ledger maintained in the accounting department, purchased off the shelf and used with no programme amendments. So the, the payables ledger is using SAGE uh, or a standardised computer programme, and therefore CATS is possible in Part 4, and then... Five, online payment to suppliers also in the accounts department. Well, that's just, you know, sort of, uh, what, what do you call that? Uh, internet banking. That's just internet banking. And part six, a computerized nominal ledger, which is updated by the uh, payables ledger. But it doesn't say, oh, yeah, a computerized nominal ledger, which is updated by the payables ledger. If it's updated by the payables ledger, presumably it's part of the off-the-shelf program. So the nominal ledger and the payables ledger is off the shelf. So bits of their business are standardised. So maybe there might be a bit of D, maybe. Mobile telephones are assembled in batches of 10,000 to 50,000 telephones. When the batch is scheduled for production, a list of parts is produced by the design software and sent electronically to the ordering department. Staff in the ordering department use this list to place orders with the authorised suppliers, so suppliers need to be authorised. Orders can only be sent to suppliers on the supplier's database. Uh, orders are sent using electronic data interchange, which presumably means um, email, and confirmed by each supplier using the same system, so they send an email back saying, yes, I've got your order. The list of parts and orders are retained on the computer, uh, in an orders placed file, which is kept in date sequence. So, yeah, they have, you know, orders. They have goods orders notes. They have uh, purchase order notes in, in the computer. Uh, parts are delivered to the goods inwards department at Westra. So when goods come in, they go into the goods inwards department. All deliveries are checked against the orders placed before being accepted. Well, that's good, so they open the box and make sure, you know, the stuff that we've received agrees to what we've ordered. A handwritten pre-numbered goods received note, well, that's a problem, obviously, handwritten, is raised in the goods inwards department, showing the details of the goods received with a cross-reference to the date and the order. 
The top copy of the GRN is sent to the accounts department and the second copy is retained in the goods inwards department. The orders are placed at file. The orders placed file is updated with the GRN to show that the parts have been received. Oh, goodness me. So when we get goods, then the order note is ticked to say that that order has been fulfilled and the goods have been received. It's terribly complicated, isn't it? Paper invoices are sent by all suppliers following dispatch of goods. So they send us invoices in the post rather than surprisingly, not by email. Invoices are sent to the goods account, sorry, to the accounts department, fine, where they're stamped with a unique ascending number. <laughs> so they're going to be numbered by the, uh, by the guys receiving these invoices. Invoice details are matched to the GRN, to the goods received note. Oh yeah, of course, we don't want to end up paying for something we haven't received, which is then attached to the invoice. So we staple the GRN to the invoice. We should really staple the purchase order note to the GRN, to the invoice. But anyway, invoice details are then entered into the computerized payables ledger. Oh yeah, okay, so we recognize the liability when we have two things. One is the invoice and the other is the goods received note. The invoice is signed by the account clerk to confirm entry into the payables ledger, but it's not signed for authorization for payment. So, the invoices are then retained in a temporary file in normal order while awaiting payment. So we've got some sort of I don't know intray. Took the invoice into an intray until it gets paid. After 30 days, the payables ledger automatically generates a computerized list of payments to be made, which is sent electronically to the chief accountant. So he kind of has a suggestion of who should be paid. The chief accountant compares this list to the invoices and signs each invoice to indicate approval for a, a payment. So the computer suggests who should be paid, but the chief accountant actually decides who should be paid and how much. And then forwards the electronic payments list to the accounts assistant. The assistant uses online banking to pay the suppliers. The electronic payments list is filed in month order in the computer. <laughs> that is a heck of a scenario and all you can really do is just have a bash at it and try and mug the examiner for um, as many marks as you possibly can. Now don't forget in the examination you will be doing this question last. By doing it last it'll, it'll speed you up, it'll make you more aggressive. Hopefully you'll be feeling already reasonably confident that you did a good job of questions two, three, and four. You did an okay job with question five. So your confidence should be okay. So really all you need to knock out this question is a little bit of aggression. So here we go. So the question is Westra question is Westra from the pilot paper. Starting with part B, list the audit procedure. Um, explain the purpose. Um, so far, when we have been doing the pilot paper, we've used the mnemonic A-E-I-O-U. It probably is the best mnemonic for generating substantive procedures. Um, but we might be in danger of, you know, overusing that mnemonic if we use it again here in Part B. There's another mnemonic which um, we've had a look at in previous tapes, but I'll remind you of it. It's called PROVE, P-R-O-V-E. Presentation, records, ownership, valuation, and existence. It's what's called the audit assertions. Presentation, records, ownership, valuation, and existence. And I think just for a bit of variety, I'm going to use PROVE for part B. So let's have a look at it again. List the audit procedures you should perform on the trade payables balance. Because we're auditing a balance, 
we are substantiating a balance. And when one is substantiating a balance, one is doing substantive procedures. So here we go. Presentation. Um, one big presentational ex uh, problem that exists both in debtors and in creditors is occasionally when you're in debtors, you end up with credit balances. And when you're in creditors, you sometimes end up with debit balances. So what happens is they supply you some goods. You pay them, and therefore you don't owe them anything. Ah, oh, but then you open the box, and then you find that the goods are damaged. You send the goods back, and then the year end falls. So what's happened there? You've sent the goods back. You haven't got the goods, but you've already paid for them. In that case, they owe you. So they're actually a debtor. Your supplier ends up being a debtor and therefore ends up being a debit balance. And it does happen, you get these debit balances in amongst the credit balances. And obviously the debit balances are debtors, so you're taking out of creditors and putting into debtors. But when you take a debtor out of creditors and put it into debtors, obviously it doesn't change you know, the balance sheet. The balance sheet will still balance. If you take a debit out of here and move it up there, then the balance sheet will still balance, of course. But it is a presentational issue. It changes the presentation of the balance sheet, and therefore it's, it's the test I'm going to do, my first test. I would review the list of supplier balances for negative balances. I would review the list of supplier balances for negative balances. These data balances need to move to receivables these data balances need to move to receivables p r r is uh, records Now, as it says in this, um, in this system, um, within part one to six, at the, the top of the scenario, they have um, two ways, two areas in which creditors are recorded. One is called the nominal ledger, where the T-accounts occur. So the T-accounts occur, I think, in part six. There they are. So the T-account in the nominal ledger for creditors will have a balance. But there's also something called the payables ledger, where the details of the uh, supplier balances are to be found. And in the payables ledger, you'll also have a total for payables. So you'll have a total for payables in the payables ledger, and you'll also have a, have a total for payables in the nominal ledger. But these two ledgers are actually separate. They're related, but they're separate. So they will have individual figures for payables. And of course those individual payables figures should agree. They should be identical. But they're not necessarily identical. So what businesses do is they do a test known as the creditor's ledger control account reconciliation. The creditor's ledger control account reconciliation. The creditor's ledger control account Reconciliation. A very technical name, right? So they will do the creditor's ledger control account reconciliation and we will re-perform it. 
I would reperform the creditors ledger control account reconciliation I would reperform the creditors ledger control account reconciliation and the reason for this is to confirm that the internal records agree with one another this is to confirm that internal records agree with each other. Uh, this is to confirm that internal records agree with each other. Okay, so uh, O is normally ownership, but as we're talking about liabilities, I guess it's obligation. Obligation. I would agree a sample of payables balances to the invoice and GRN. I would agree a sample of payables balances to the invoice and GRN. Uh, this would verify that obligations are genuine. An obligation wouldn't be genuine unless we'd received the goods in particular. Also, unless we got the invoice, but more particularly that we have the goods received note. It's really the goods received note that's key. So it's P, R, O, and V for valuation. Um, there's a number of tests that one could do for valuation of creditors, but there's one that I used to get a lot of mileage out of myself when I was doing audit, and that is, uh, you'll be surprised how often this happens. Um, you might have done this yourself when you were doing your financial reporting for your own company. Um, you get an invoice, right, for 20 items, but the... Um, the goods inwards clerk tells you that three of those 20 items are damaged. So what you do is you take the whole invoice and you throw it back and you say, I'm not going to recognise any of this liability until you send me a credit note or until you reissue a correct invoice. Now, actually, to be honest with you, you are quite happy that you do owe for 17 items. But because you're unhappy with part of the invoice, you throw the whole invoice away. Do you agree? So it's quite common for um, accountants to understate creditors because they reject a whole invoice when actually it's only part of the invoice that's disputed. So I'm going to look for that. I would ask the purchases manager if there are 
any invoices that are part disputed. Um, I would ask the purchaser's manager if there are any invoices that are part disputed. This will identify any liabilities that are accepted but ignored because of a partial dispute. And there's, you know, four good tests that you could use as regards the uh, Part B. Um, so on to Part C. Part C is now looking at uh, designing controls in order to protect data on behalf of the company, on behalf of Westra. So we're going to suggest to Westra what sort of controls they should have to prevent themselves from being defrauded as regards their, their payables balances. So part C, describe the control procedures, in other words controls, that should be in place over the standing data on the trade payables master file in Westraco's uh, com uh, computer system. Um, I I'm just going to come up with stuff off the top of my head and see what it looks like. Passwords. The uh, data should only be accessible by password. Um, segregation. Segregation. The, the member of staff amending the standing data say accountant should be separate from the person involved in purchases should be separate from people involved in management, uh, from people involved in purchases. Says the purchases manager. Purchases, clerk, etc. Um, you shouldn't just be able to amend data. You must you must create a form. Form. The should be a. Purchases, standing data. Have I said that right? Purchases or payables? Payables, isn't it, is a better word. Payables. Similar, but not exactly the same thing. There should be a payables standing data 
Amendment for uh, compiled by the accountant. Um, authorization. Uh, the, the form should be authorised by a director. The form should be authorised by a director. And I think that's four now. Yeah, it's four. So the last one, I, I like internal audit as the last one. You just get internal audit to look at things and there you go, there's a mark. Internal audit. Internal audit. Should. Review. All amendments annually. And no doubt you've thought of other controls that would be appropriate. Like, for example, physical controls. You should uh, lock the door on the uh, purchases, um, uh, purchase ledger clerk's area every night. You should have a separate computer f uh, for purchases from uh, payables. I do apologise for purchases and payables from receivables and sales. Um, you should have some sort of physical documentation from the supplier actually requesting a change. So that should be stapled to the form. Um, you know, a change of address, evidence coming from the actual supplier to evidence that they really have changed their address and that should be stapled to the form. There's all sorts of other controls that you could think of, not necessarily these, these particular five. On to part D. We've kind of made up our mind already, haven't we, that we're not going to be using cats. But we can't just say, you know, we're not going to use cats. That is worth a mark, but we need to try and generate uh, five marks it is. Five marks. So here we go, D. Um, well, it says discuss, so we can really talk around it. Discuss the extent to which computer-assisted audit techniques might be used in your audit of purchases and payables at Westra. Cats. Should we just start nice and simple with just saying what cats are? Computer-assisted audit techniques involves us using our computers to audit the data and systems on their computers, or computer. The computer-assisted audit techniques involves us using our computers to audit data and systems on their computers, which is absolutely true. Effective cats Cats are only effective and efficient if Controls are excellent uh, 
almost all records are computerized. and standard programs are in use like SAGE or SAP is another one and it's just not the case CATs are only effective and efficient if controls are excellent almost all records are computerized and standard programs are in use Problem one, paper. Much of Westra records are paper based. E.g invoices uh, wasn't it GRN were handwritten or something like that handwritten pre number goods received note so GRN there's, there's all sorts I don't want to go into too much detail otherwise I'll get sucked into the scenario and won't get another point but as you can see much of Western records are paper based which is bad but even when they are using computer there is, there is a bespoke system that's used for the standing data. Problem two. Bespoke system. Also, there is a bespoke system for the standing data. Conclusion I suggest, therefore, that the use of cats um, would be very limited. The effectiveness of cats would be very limited. I suggest, therefore. that the effectiveness of cats would be limited. And of course, in an ideal world, you would then go on to say it might be limited to use within the payables ledger and the nominal ledger. But as soon as you look at your clock, you realize you're running out of time. We've got, as you can see, five marks for part D. There are five headings. There are five sentences. That's going to have to do because you've got to get on to part A. Part A is rock hard. Twelve marks there. You're not going to get twelve marks. That's not going to happen. But if you can get six, that might be, well, six. I mean, is six going to be useful? It's going to be useful if you're anywhere between 44 and 50. And you're going to get far more marks for whacking something down on part A than twiddling with part D. Part D is done. Leave it. Go on to part A. Part A. Really tough. List the substantive audit procedures. For purchases, for each procedure, explain. Uh, 
and 12 marks gives you six tests, doesn't it? Six tests, but each of those six tests is divided between completeness, occurrence, and cutoff. Let's start with cutoff because it is the easiest. Um, cut off. We just sample a whole load of goods received notes either side of the year end and confirm that they have been accounted for in the correct year. Uh, but what should we do for our second cut off test? Um, well, let's get that one down first. Yeah. I would select a sample of GRN either side of the year end. and match to uh, invoices in the payables ledger. Cool. I would select a sample of GRN either side of the year end and match to invoices in the payables ledger. Um, this will confirm that purchases are recognised in the year of goods received. This will confirm that purchases are recognised in the year of goods received. Uh, for cut-off two, I think what I'll do is I think I'll go for invoices. I'll do what's called directional testing. What we've done is we've gone in one direction, We've gone from the goods received notes to the invoice, but now what I'm going to do is going to go from the invoice to the goods received notes. Cut off two. I will sample a few invoices either side of the year end and and match to GRN in the same year. This is the opposite direction to the test above, but is also aimed at checking purchases are recognized in the right year.
Gosh, this is tough, isn't it? So there's a couple of cut-off tests. Four marks. Working our way to the next one, occurrence. Occurrence and completeness are really similar, but they're slightly different. Um, of course, otherwise, why would you need two words? Occurrence is testing whether something that has been recorded really did happen, and completeness is looking for something that did happen but wasn't recorded. Okay? So they're the opposite, they're kind of the same thing, but they're the opposite way around. So when you test for occurrence, you're checking for something that was recorded, did it really occur? It was recorded, but did it really happen? That's occurrence. For completeness, you're looking for something that hasn't been recorded, but did happen. So, ah, this thing did happen, but it wasn't recorded. So the records are said to be incomplete. <whistles> That's really tough. So let's have a couple of tests on occurrence. Occurrence with an A. Occurrence one. So how are we going to test whether something that was recorded did happen? Well, it's going to be very similar to the cutoff test, apart from instead of doing it around the year end, you'll do it for the whole year. I will sample a few invoices during the year and match to invoices. This will verify that purchases recorded really did occur. This will verify the purchases recorded really did occur. They really did happen. So we need another occurrence test. Occurrence two. So I want to try and find out uh, whether something, I guess in a way we're looking for a fraud, we're looking for, this is maybe a, a, little, bit, a little bit difficult to spot, but if a transaction was recorded but didn't really happen, then the chances are it's a fraud and someone's just whacked through an invoice and didn't supply anything. So one way of looking for non-occurrence is to, is to look for suppliers that don't really fit the tune of the business. So here we go, let's try this. I would review the list of suppliers for any suspicious accounts. This may identify uh, purchases that did not occur because of fraud. This may identify purchases that did not occur because of fraud, and that would be a test for occurrence. And the last one, thank goodness, is completeness.
Now, the only way to know this is to know this. The classic test for completeness is analytical review. I would compare G, P, M month by month and look for any unexplained rise. Quite a tough one that. Everything about this last part A is very tough. GPM is gross profit margin. Gross profit margin goes up when purchases go down. Under what circumstances could purchases go down? If you have unrecorded purchases, if you have incompleteness of recording, that would result in this. So I would compare GPM month by month and look for any unexplained rise. This may identify unrecorded purchases and finally completeness too completeness too I would review the unfulfilled purchase orders to find an explanation. What could be a possible explanation for an unfulfilled purchase order? Well, actually, an unfulfilled purchase order could have been fulfilled. The goods could have been received, and we could really have received those goods. But we didn't record it, and how did you spot that we didn't record this particular purchase? Because you looked at orders that were apparently unfulfilled. They were apparently unfulfilled, but they were actually fulfilled. This will identify any orders that were fulfilled, but the GRN went missing. This will identify any orders that were fulfilled, but the GRN went missing. Now hopefully, in the last few minutes of this question, hopefully, as I was doing this question, I've convinced you just how difficult classically question one is. Question one is nearly always extremely difficult and it is amazingly common to identify that question 1A is the hardest thing in the entire exam. So please, if you've learned anything while you've been doing this question, learn that it is very important the order that you do the questions. Not just the questions, but the parts of the question. It is absolutely fine in the, in the case of question Westra to do B, C, D and then come back and do A. Just make it nice and clear that you're doing things in that order by making it clear with your B, your C, your D, and then a very, very clear A. Okay, thank you very much. That's Westra.